Hello everyone, my name is Abby. I'm actually from the Massachusetts Office on Disability. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I just want to draw your attention to the three things that you have with you today um, that was on your seat. And we do have some extras if you need anybody, you need any more if anybody else comes in. Um, so today, all the information I'm gonna talk about is gonna be in this first packet. And so I'll be going through page by page so just follow along and, and you'll be good. Um, the second packet, we'll take a stop halfway to talk about. And then the third thing is an evaluation form. Um, so if you liked me as a presenter, if you liked this presentation, please give us good marks so that we can continue bringing this program to other folks all across Massachusetts. So if you actually flip to the first page, you can see a little bit about what we do we're a small state agency, um, and we do everything we can in the Commonwealth to ensure that everybody with access and functional needs, disabilities, has access to equal participation in um, life. And so the reason that we started this program in particular actually came out of a response, um, a very bad response to an emergency situation. Now, back in 2005, we all remember Hurricane Katrina, right? And we remember what a disaster <laughs> that was in terms of managing the response. So across the country, and especially here in Massachusetts, we decided we're never gonna let anything like that happen again. And so what happened was people from the Massachusetts Office on Disability, uh, local <coughs> town managers, disabled activists, um, everybody came together they had a task force, and they came up with recommendations for how to make sure that something like that never happens again. Um, specifically, what really prompted them to do all of this action is that they found in, hurricane, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, of the people who died, 50% were seniors and people with disabilities. So that's why, we, <laughs> that's why we were so involved and that's why everybody came together from the disability community. So we're gonna talk about um, all the ways that you can be individually prepared for an emergency. We're gonna talk about all of the state resources and the local resources you have available to you. I do wanna let you know that the next couple pages are kind of a high level overview, a high level summary of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but other than that, we're going to keep going forward. All right, so the first thing that should put your mind at ease is that now every city and town in Massachusetts, all 351 of them, have two things. They have one, an emergency management director, and two, an emergency management plan. So the emergency management director, <laughs> in larger towns, there might be an emergency management department, but in smaller towns, it's usually the fire chief or the police chief. Um, and so they're a public official. If you have specific needs, you can reach out to them. If you have specific questions about your town's plan, please talk to them. They, they are continuously updating the town's emergency management plan to make sure that it includes people of all abilities, disabilities, and all different types of needs. So please, we, we really encourage you um, from the office of MOD to reach out and build relationships with those folks. Now the second thing I mentioned is the emergency management plan. So how come you've never seen that before? And how come I'm not gonna show it to you today? <laughs> it's not because the government's very secretive or anything like that, no. The reason that you haven't seen the plan is that when an emergency happens, your town officials, your first responders, they want you to listen to their instructions and not instructions that you see on a plan that might have been compromised because they're responding to real-time updates. So for example, if the senior center is listed as a potential shelter, but there's flooding at the senior center and it's not safe to come here, well, if you check the plan, if you knew what the plan was and you saw, oh, the senior center is open for a warming shelter, let me go there, and then you showed up here, it would be a dangerous situation. So instead, we don't want you to look at the plan. We don't want you to study up or anything like that. Instead, when an emergency happens, what we want you to do is listen for information from your local and state responders. So that begs the question, 
where do you get that information? And we're gonna spend a significant time talking about that because that's the most important thing is where do you get the information? Where do you know, how do you know where to go and what to do? So if you flip the page, <laughs> the first thing I'll talk about is 211, Mass 211. So what this is, it's a phone number, of course. You can dial 211 during a non-emergency time, which I will stress is 99% of the time. Um, during a non-emergency, Mass 211 acts as a service connector. You can call them, find out about um, community resources, volunteer opportunities. They also have, uh, they kind of act as a Good Samaritan's hotline if you're having you know, if you're feeling down and you just need somebody to talk to, you can give them a call. But during an emergency, an agency called MEMA staffs 211. So now we've all heard of FEMA, right? The Federal Emergency Management Agency. Well, here in Massachusetts, we have MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. So um, they're like FEMA's state partner. And during a time of emergency, the 211 line is staffed specifically by MEMA operators. So those are folks that are trained emergency management professionals. They're the ones talking to the town officials, sending out information, coordinating, and they will have the most up-to-date information. Um, and so if you have any questions, where do I go? Should I evacuate? Should I shelter in place? We'll talk about what those words mean in a minute. Um, if you, um, need help reunifying with friends or family or things like that, give them a call and they can help out. So 2 on one is a really great resource. Um, some other resources, can, can anybody think where else could you get information? Not, don't turn the page yet, just think. Anybody, any ideas? The, library. the fire department, the library, maybe, but you might have to drive to the library to get the information. So if you're stuck at home, the police want right the non-emergency numbers, right? That's another reason why we want to use 211 is because you don't want to call 911 and say, hey, what should I be doing right now? Or like, my, my power is out. We want to keep 911 open for life-threatening emergencies. Of course, if you have a life-threatening emergency, feel free to call 911. But if you just need information, 211, what about social media right you can follow the fire department or the police department on social media um, the, if, you have a phone. if you have a phone right um, if you have a tv right the local news stations um, sometimes there's something called the emergency broadcast system right you know that always interrupts you the tests always interrupt while you're watching your favorite TV shows, right? Right. Well, in a time of emergency, you'll be happy that they did those tests so that it is working, right? Um, so, right, so there's a, the emergency broadcast system. That's part of a system called reverse 911. So when you have an issue, you call 911. When the state has a large-scale emergency, they're going to call you. So they're going to do blasts on the TV, um, they might give you a phone call. Now they do mass texts. Um, so if you have a smartphone, you'll get a text. So that's another way to stay involved. Uh, some towns even have their own alert system for local emergencies. So you can check that out. Talk to your fire department, <coughs> police department. Um, yeah, those are, all, those are all great. And now since we're talking about 911 a little bit, um, I'll give you a few helpful tips and tricks. If you do have to call them or do need to use them, whether um, in a large scale emergency or just you know, the emergencies that happen day to day individually. So you will see on the next page, text to 911 is now available in the Commonwealth. So text to 911, I'll stress, it's not available across the country. Some states have it and some don't. Um, but here in Massachusetts, we do have text to 911. This is really good in an emergency situation if you need to stay quiet or if you have trouble communicating verbally um, or you know, in spoken, yeah, verbally. <laughs> um, so it works just the same as if you were texting your friend or your sister or your daughter. Um, in the two, like as if you were writing in the phone number, just type 911 and then you can start t talking to an operator and they'll text you and you'll have a phone conversation that way. Not exactly a phone conversation, but a text conversation. 
Um, again, this is really good if, you know, heaven forbid, there's an active shooter, a burglary, anything like that. Um, issues of domestic violence, for example, those are all, you know, good cases to use this in. Um, and also if, you know, maybe you have hearing um, impairments um, and it's, it's difficult that way. Um, another way to reach 911 that's not quote unquote traditional, flip the page once more, we have something called the silent call procedure. So similar but a little different in that if you do not have a cell phone that you can text uh, 911 to, but you are also in a position where you can't speak for what other, whatever reason, um, 911 operators are trained to know that if they receive a call and there's silence on the other end from, from you, the caller, they're trained to know that that's not an abandoned call, it's not a prank call. They are trained to go through this silent call procedure. So um, what will happen is you will call, and let's say you can't talk for whatever reason, you'll give 911 a call and you just stay quiet. They'll answer the phone and they'll say, 911, this is a recorded line. Where's your emergency? Again, just stay silent. Don't hang up the phone. They'll ask the question a second time. 911, this is a recorded line. Where's your emergency? Stay quiet. Then they'll say, stand by for the TTY challenge. Now, TTY refers to a type of adaptive telephone equipment so that um, you know, users who are deaf, hard of hearing, maybe have visual impairments, they have particular technology to help them talk on the phone. And so the operator wants to make sure, is this is somebody using adaptive telephone equipment? Is that the reason I'm not hearing anything? So you'll hear a series of tones. They'll do that twice. Again, stay on the line. <laughs> and then finally they'll say, all right, if you need police, please press one. If you need fire, press two. And if you need an ambulance, press three. And then you can use your keypad tone uh, touch touchpad, sorry, um, to press the appropriate button. And then they'll say, I see you've pressed two for, for fire. Um, is that correct? Please press four for yes, five for no. And then they'll continue the conversation like that with a series of binary questions. Can you confirm your address? Please press four for yes, five for no, and go on like that. So that's another way that you can access 911. Again, Texting and the silent call procedure, it takes a little extra time. So if you can call, you should definitely do that. Um, it's the fastest way to get emergency services. It's the fastest way to get emergency services dispatched um, and to get the information you need. But these are available if you need them. All right, good. Yes. So if you had a stroke and you couldn't speak. Right. Right, so th that's a great question that we'll get to it in a second. If, if you were able to use the silent call procedure, um, if you were able to press the button, four for yes, five for no, that would be a way that you can confirm um, the address. Um, but in Massachusetts, of course, if they have your landline, if, if you're calling from a landline, it'll be easy to pinpoint your location. Um, if you're calling from a cell phone, it can be a little trickier Massachusetts has really good technology, so we're pretty good about it. Um, but that, again, that's why they, the first thing that they ask you when you call 911 isn't what's your emergency, it's where's your emergency, because we don't have, you know, not everybody uses landlines all the time anymore. So that's like the number one piece of information you should give them. Um, but yes, so if you can use the silent call procedure to press four or five, that would be great. Um, and then one other thing that I'll talk about that will sort of answer your question, is this thing called the Disability Indicator Form. So it's front and back. The front page describes, um, if you flip the page once more, um, the front page describes what it is, and I will describe for you right now, and then the next page is the form itself. So what this is, is a completely voluntary disclosure form that you will fill out yourself, or fill out for somebody else, and deliver to um, the police department. And so what this form does is if you provide them, well, you have to provide them your phone number for this tour, you provide them a, your phone number, and then you check these boxes indicating 
if somebody with that phone number or in that household has any particular disabilities. Now, what this does is when the 911 operator receives your call and they know your phone number, it will, this information will be in their system so that right on the screen it'll pop up and they'll say, okay, this person, the person is calling has a speech impediment or um, has life supporting medical, durable medical equipment. And that is information that they, the 911 operators, can share to the emergency responders that they're dispatching. So again, this is completely voluntary. Um, it used to be that you could only you fill out this form if you had the landline, but now you can use a cell phone. Um, VOIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. So if you have, for example, a Google phone number or a phone number that you use through Wi-Fi, um, that's available. So really any phone number. And then again, if you call from the phone number that you listed on um, this form, that information will pop up. So it's really helpful. Um, and again, then the, the 911 operator can, uh, how do you say, they can adapt, they can tell the dispatcher to adapt their protocols. Another communication tool we have is something called Show Me for Emergencies. Now this is um, a booklet that is also an app. It's free to download. You can, um, and once you download it, it um, doesn't require internet to use. Um, I have a printed copy, so let me show you that. So what this does is this is another good tool for somebody who's having difficulty communicating in English, um, verbally, other for any other reasons that it would make communication difficult to, to talk verbally. Um, so what it is is it's a series of icons that have to do with an emergency situation. So um, or if you were to go to a shelter, for example, you could use this. So let's say the fire chief knocks on your door at night and you're like, why are you here? But you can't talk to them um, you know, verbally. You can flip to this page about my home and perhaps they can point to the particular icon that responds to the, that correlates with the situation that's happening. And they can tell you, you need to evacuate. You need to shelter in place. Um, you know, pack your things. And you can also use this to communicate with them. You know, tell them like, I need oxygen, I need insulin. Um, and this can be, we'll talk a little bit about going to a shelter. This, this can be very helpful there. So again, um, highly recommend if um, you know anybody who has trouble speaking in English. Otherwise, um, the, first, the first set of icons is actually, you know, I need an interpreter or I need sign language. Um, and the app is available in, I think, 10 to 15 different languages. So definitely make use of that. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about in terms of communicating with emergency responders, getting information, everything like that, um, I wanted to provide you with some behavioral and mental health um, resources. So um, in Massachusetts, we have just started in January, so just three to four, four months ago now, so it's brand spanking new, um, something called the Behavioral Health Helpline. So this, it, it serves as a hotline too, but you can also call it in a non-emergency situation. But this is a really good um, line to call if you or somebody you know is having a behavioral health crisis. That could be a mental health crisis, could be a substance use disorder crisis, or you simply want to know where in your community you can get more localized support, what community services are available. Um, and so this, you'll see lower down on the page, we have something called Community Behavioral Health Centers. So every city and town in Massachusetts has a designated Community Behavioral Health Center. It might not be in the town itself, there aren't 351 of these health centers, but there are um, each town has its own designated health center. So if you call this phone number, text them, um, you can even use the chat feature at masshelpline.com, they'll let you know, um, they'll get you connected to resources at that center. There are even mobile crisis teams that can be dispatched. Um, it's a, an alternative to calling 911 if somebody's having a mental health crisis because sometimes the police aren't 
exactly trained to help in a mental health crisis or a substance use crisis, or people are afraid to call the police. Um, so instead, the line is staffed by behavioral health professionals. They can do crisis evaluation over the phone. They can say, okay, can you come down to the center tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.? We will like help evaluate and everything like that. So that's a good, a good resource. And then of course there's the new, well, somewhat new, a couple years old new um, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You must have heard of 988 before. Um, so that is a national number. You can call 988 um, anywhere in the country. And if you're in emotional distress or somebody you know is, um, and they can help out. Um, all right, so that's kind of wrapping it up for communications during an emergency. Any questions before I go on? Anything? We're good? People feeling good? Also, don't forget to grab cookies <laughs> later, anything like that. Um, okay, uh, let's take a pause and look at this packet. This one right here, and we'll go. We'll go back to the the bigger packet. But um, okay, I lied. This this is one one extra thing about communication. So um, what this packet is, um, it's where you can store all of your personal information um, safely. Like you don't have to put your exact bank account number, but you can put the bank phone number. Um, and this can be really helpful in case you do need to talk to um, an emergency medical professional. Um, and for example, like, um, have you heard of a file of life before, right? You know, like a magnet that you can put on your fridge and it lists all your medical conditions. When an emergency responder comes into your house, um, they're trained to look for that and so they can understand what your medical conditions are before administering care. Well, this is really good if you have to go to a shelter, for example, if your computer's dead and you don't have all your, you know, or your phone's dead and you don't have all your phone numbers available to you, um, this is a space where you can include that information. Um, and what we're going to talk about right now is what to do in an emergency. And so, in particular, this second half, this right half of the page, um, is going to get us started. So, um, You've got a space to write your emergency contacts. Um, at the top, you've got local resources. So yes, you can put your police department's non-emergency numbers. But then the emergency contacts are your personal contacts. And these are folks that you're going to want to coordinate with during an emergency. Um, we recommend that folks have at least one contact that's out of state, um, or not out of state, but out of town at least. Um, and the reason for that is we want um, you to be able to have a reliable source of information who's not in the emergency itself. Um, so somebody you can call to help coordinate between friends and family, you know, give them a call, say, hey, um, can you give my brother a call? I'm gonna pack for a few minutes and then I wanna meet him at the library, um, but my phone's almost dead so I, don't, I can't talk for very long. Um, and then they can start to, to coordinate, help you coordinate there. Um, and then for possible shelter locations, again, I would say like, you know, if you can stay with local friends and family um, instead of going to a public shelter, which we're about to talk about. Um, and you can also think about your evacuation route um, where, where you, you know, if, you know, if you live in an apartment, for example, how are you gonna get out? Um, if you use a wheelchair, um, how are you gonna, and the elevators go down, what are you gonna do? So these are all questions that you can talk to your building managers about um, if you have specific questions um, because they'll have an emergency plan as well. So you can, if you live in an apartment, for example, um, sometimes they'll say, okay, stay in your room. We know about you. We'll tell the, we'll tell the first responders that you're there. Sometimes they'll ask you to go to the, um, not the fire escape, the, you know, the, the stairwell and meet emergency responders there. So talk to them. Um, figure out the best way that you could um, evacuate if you needed to. Okay, um, and this has got some other information about specific disasters and things like that. We're gonna we're gonna go over it now. <laughs> so, um, in a large scale emergency that affects you know not just you know you, um, but you know a, a wide swath of people. Uh, your government is going to ask you to do one of two things. 
Um, one, they're going to ask you to shelter in place. Two, they're going to ask you to evacuate. So sheltering in place, I kind of think of it as quarantine, you know, without the delivery service. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we've all been through nor'easters or blizzards where they say, okay, stay off the roads just to keep them clear for emergency vehicles. It's not safe. Um, you want to stay inside. That's sheltering in place. Um, and evacuating means that it is not safe in the area that you are um, and that you have to leave and you can go visit or stay with you know, friends and family or you know, your emergency contacts or go to a public shelter. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what to expect at a public shelter. Um, in both cases, it's good to have an emergency go bag, which I will open and share and everybody will leave with one, so don't worry about that. Um, it's good to have an emergency go kit um, because it's got some hyg hygienic supplies and emergency supplies. It's good to take this you know, packet, fill it out, keep it in your emergency bag so that you have it. Um, if you were to take this back to a shelter, then you have all of your information in one spot. Um, so in either case, that will be very helpful. Um, and let's see, where do I want to start? Hmm. Okay, let's say that you have to, um, well, let me, let, me, let me tell you why it's important to be prepared. Um, I know you're all here, so I know you think it's important, but let me, let me give you a, a little bit of extra motivation. Um, it is not very likely that you will have to evacuate in your life. You know, we're, we're planning here for worst case scenarios, um, that you know there's a small chance that it will happen but there is precedence for it um, so we do want you to be prepared you know if you think back um, a couple years ago to the Merrimack Valley fires do you remember that up in the Lawrence Andover area um, there was a gas leak and they you know people's stoves just started exploding randomly and it was not safe to be in that area so 30,000 people basically overnight had to evacuate um, and the highways were totally tied up for hours and it was a mess. Um, it was a mess until people got to the shelters and you know got settled in. But those folks weren't allowed to return to their apartments for three to four months because that was how long it took to make sure that the area was safe. So we want you to think about, again, I don't tell you this because I think there's gonna be more gas leaks. In fact, um, our current governor, when she was attorney general, she actually sued the company who was responsible for the gas leaks, and now they're never allowed to operate in Massachusetts again. <laughs> that was part of the settlement. So that should put your mind at ease. But there are these situations where, um, you know, you, you want to be prepared just in case. If the fire chief knocked on your door at 11 p.m. at night and said, hey, there's a gas leak, we, we don't know if it's safe for you to be here, what do you need to have with you? and what do you need to um, know to be prepared to respond? Um, because not everybody, well, most people <laughs> in an emergency situation can get a little cranky, can get a little scared, panicky, irritable, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to avoid those feelings. I mean, it's okay if you have those feelings, it's very natural, but we wanna help you feel like, okay, no, I, I know what to do, I'm, I'm prepared, I'm in control. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, um, if you need to evacuate, but you don't know where to go, where can you get that information? Does anybody remember? 211, yes, perfect, excellent, excellent. Uh, so 211 is great. Um, so you can give them a call and they'll tell you what shelters are open. Um, now you arrive at the shelter. Um, there will be a brief screening process. Um, this is a good time to Ask for reasonable accommodations. If you need to use the show me tool on your app, you know, you, you have the right um, to have these reasonable accommodations. Um, so for example, if you need um, like a wheelchair bed or um, a refrigerator to keep medicine cold, those sorts of things. Um, one thing that I'll also mention is that in Massachusetts, there are no divisions of shelters. There's no accessible shelter, inaccessible shelter, no senior shelter, no family shelter. There are just public, general public shelters. All of the shelters are accessible 
and they're, they're monitored to make sure that they're, they, they are at least prepared to be accessible. This prevents people you know, needing to be split up from their families or anything like that, um, and it should put your mind at ease. Another thing that people might not know about shelters is that they all accept pets. So that was something that we, another lesson that we learned from Katrina, is that a lot of people stayed home and did not follow the orders to evacuate because they didn't want to leave their pets. They were told the shelters do not accept pets and you cannot come here with your pets. Now pets are our family, right? So we, and people don't want to abandon them. So you can bring your pets to the shelter. I cannot guarantee that you will stay with your pet the entire time. Um, you know, the animal control officer might take them to a local animal shelter, um, but uh, there are some helpful tips. Oh no, where am I? Okay, if you go back to the packet, um, there are some helpful tips for preparing your pet for a disaster. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it all right now, but um, just know that in Massachusetts, you can bring your pets. Please do not ignore an order to evacuate because you think you, you'll be separated from your pet. If you are separated, it'll be temporary. Um, so you can bring, you know, their particular food or vaccine records, you know, rabies vaccination card or, or collar, leash, things like that. The favorite chew toys, you know, to make them feel <laughs> less anxious too. Um, so yes, so please do that. Um, all right, now I'm gonna talk about preparing you for an emergency. <laughs> so, um, at the shelter you can bring, you know, you're not, they're not gonna turn you away for having too much stuff. They're, you know, they're not gonna say like, oh, like your, your uh, luggage doesn't fit in the overhead compartment. You know, like it's, it's not gonna be like that. You know, you're not going on vacation, but you can bring materials, you know, your medication. If you have time, if it's safe, um, you know, you can pack clean clothes, a hygiene kit, things like that. Um, and so those are things that you can also store in advance in your emergency bag, uh, which I'm going to open right now. There's a list here of um, suggested items for your kit. Um, I'm going to show you what we're giving you uh, from the Mass Office on Disability. I'm going to show you what we've already got ready for you, and these are all free, um, so you're welcome. <laughs> um, so let me get you. Let me show you what we've got. Okay. And I'm going to move these cookies just a little bit oh, so I can keep everything out. Okay. All right. We good, Nick? <laughs> okay. So the first thing that I want to show you in this bag is we've got you water, pouches of water. Um, now, these pouches of water don't expire for five years. And you say, well, water doesn't expire. Well, the water bottles that we use in general have, they're made with a particular type of plastic that you really don't want to drink it after about a year or so, the plastic might degrade. Um, but these are specially designed. So um, we've got you 12 of these. A good rule of thumb is you want to have one gallon, no, Yes, one gallon of water per day, per person. Um, more in the summer months if it's hot. So you can also fill up this portable water jug that we've got you. Um, if you know that there's gonna be, um, you know, the pipes might freeze, for example. Or you can fill this up and make a note to um, change it out every six months or so, like mark on your calendar. You know, fill this up, put it back in the bag, and then put on your calendar, okay, change the water out every six months, right? Because we don't want the, the plastic, um, again, degrading or you know affecting the water quality. So we've got you that. Um, and then here in New England, a lot of our emergencies do have to do with inclement weather um, and the cold in particular. So we've got you some things to help keep you warm. So um, first of all, we do have these emergency ponchos not just for rain delays at Fenway Park. Um, <laughs> that does bring me to an important point. If you're ever gonna take something out of the bag and use it for a non-emergency purpose, I do recommend replenishing um, so that you, know, you don't you know, say, 
oh, you need a rain jacket, all the, an emergency poncho. It's like, no, I use that the Red Sox game. <laughs> so make sure that you know, you're punished. So we've got you two of those. Um, yeah, and so we for most of these, uh, most of the items in here, we've got you two. So if you're a couple, you can feel free to just take one, um, but I'm happy either way. So let's see, we, to also keep you warm, we've got hand warmers, pocket warmers, right? Um, you know these, you give them a good few punches um, and they'll keep you warm. Try not to put it directly on your skin, but um, I like to put them in my shoes for a little bit. Don't fall asleep with them, that's dangerous. Uh, but you can put them like under your arms or something like that. Um, where is another thing to keep you warm is, anybody can guess what this is? Yes, yes, good, an emergency blanket. Sometimes you see them at the, at the end of the Boston Marathon, you know, people wrap them in. So it looks like tin foil. This is a little more comfortable than tin foil. It's, it's much more comfortable than tin foil. <laughs> um, it's not the most comfortable fabric in the world, but it's um, something called mylar. Um, and so what this element does, or this polymer, what it does is it's really good at reflecting heat. So this in particular will reflect up to 90 to 95 percent. Oh, hello, Gail. This, this <laughs> um, Gail will be speaking after me, so don't worry. Good to see you. So I'll, I'll just finish up here. Um, so these blankets will reflect 90 to 95 percent of your body heat. So if you put it on, if you're losing body heat because it's cold, your body heat goes out. If you're wearing the blanket, it'll be reflected back onto you, and so you can stay warm. Um, you can also put like another cozier blanket on top uh, to make it a little less, mm, you know, to, to stay cozier, to be cozy. Okay, um, in addition to um, those warming items, we've also got you some sanitation and hygiene supplies. So we've got you masks, you know, if you're going to the shelter. Um, we've got you tissues, tissues. We've got um, two of these. These are um, sanitary pads. Um, so yes, typically used for people who are menstruating, but they're very absorbent. So if you know there are leaks or anything like that, um, you know, very good uh, for that. We've also got. Speaking of that, we've got a first aid kit. So this has got alcohol pads, gauze pads, Q-tips, bandages, band-aids. Um, so that's helpful. We've got this. Now, don't be scared that it says biohazard. <laughs> Basically, this is a, a trash bag, a glorified trash bag. So if you are changing dirty band-aids or you're blowing your nose with tissues, um, plop all of that in here and close it up and then the germs will stay in and you'll stay nice and healthy and safe. Because it's important to keep up with your health in an emergency. You don't want to be, you know, stuck in the cold and have a cold, right? Um, let's see what else we've got. In addition, more sanitation items. We've got antiperspirant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a presentation a couple weeks ago, and a, a gentleman <laughs> said, "Like, oh, you, you make sure you smell nice when you go to the the shelter. You might, you know, might want to pick someone up." And his wife is like <laughs> jabbing him in the side. <laughs> uh, we got a toothpaste and toothbrush. Um, and again, uh, oh, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, where is it? We got a shaving kit, razor and um, gel shaving cream. So this comes out as a gel, you know, rub it together with your hands, you got shaving cream. And now you might say, okay, it's an emergency situation. I don't care what I look like. You know, I like, no, the fire chief doesn't care if I haven't washed my face today. You know, why, why, why should I care? Because in an emergency situation, you know, things are tough. You know, it's not a normal situation. It's scary and uncomfortable and confusing. So. If you can do things to um, help take care of yourself, help feel back to normal, even just like a nice shave or washing your face, it can make a big difference. Um, we've got you shampoo, shampoo and body wash, body lotion, 
Yeah, yeah, the works. <laughs> uh, uh, soap, hand soap, a comb. Um, we're all very familiar with this, right? Hand sanitizer. Let's see, there's. Can anybody take a guess what this is? <laughs> Say it again? A washcloth, yes. Yeah. So what this is, is you take off the plastic, the, the packaging, immerse it in water, and it'll expand. And then you'll have a washcloth. So compressed washcloth. How many times does it do? I think just one. <laughs> yeah, it says one piece. So. Um, do, do, do. Okay, and then in addition to that, we've also got you some more emergency supplies. So we've got you a 14-in-1 tool. <laughs> so better than a Swiss Army knife. I'm a little scared of it, so I'm going to keep it in its nice safe packaging right here. Um, I think I think so. They have, yeah, exactly. Be careful. Be careful. But yeah, I think it does. Um, do, do, do. We've got you a can opener, right? Right. Good for canned, non-perishable foods. And then a few things to help you get the attention of emergency responders if you need to. Got a whistle. A whistle here. A glow stick. Um, so, you know, break it in half, it'll start to glow. Um, it also has a lanyard, so if, you're, if you really need to get the attention of somebody, you can also like, wind it around. It'll make a nice big circle, a little more visible. And then this is the display one. So for some reason, I must have lost it somewhere. I took this from the first backpack, so make sure I return it. Um, this right here is, I think, the best part. Uh, the best thing that we send you home with. Um, this is a four-in-one radio, flashlight, noisemaker, um, and what's the fourth thing that it is? Oh, it's a charger. So, um, flashlight, there's a button here. Do -do -do. Flashlight, very good. Um, there's the radio on the side. I think it's a little... <laughs> I think we're too far in the basement. I think we need to go outside. Uh, but you, and there's tuning, you know, scanning here on up and down. Um, there's also an SOS button on the side to make a noise. <laughs> and then it is a charger. It's, it's a power bank with um, a hand crank. So um, it does take a little bit of maneuvering, a uh, little energy like that. Um, if you open this little flap here, here, you can see there's room for a USB cord um, so that you can charge it in advance and it'll be a power bank. Or if you need to hand crank, you'll see as you turn the, it's hard to see in the back I'm sure, but there's a little light here that, that turns on. Um, I will say that your smartphones today require quite a bit of juice, quite a bit of power. So you might be doing this for a long time. So um, yeah, definitely fill up in advance, you know, use a uh, power bank it in advance, um, or hand it to somebody with a lot of upper arm strength, <laughs> which isn't even me up today. Um, so let's see, I believe that's everything. So yeah, so that's what we've got you started with. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a few more state resources if you're interested, um, and then I'm gonna hand over the presentation to Gail and she'll talk a little bit more from the DA's office perspective. And then we'll hand out the bags at the very end. So don't worry, everybody's leaving with one. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll fix this in a minute. So if you go back to our packet, um, oh yes, on the back side we also have suggested, oh yes, 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 let me ask this, let me ask you ask this question. Um, you, you do want to have you know, copies of important documents Obviously, we do not supply you with that, but I know Gail will have um, a bag for that. But what, what do you think is missing from here? What's missing in this bag? Food, exactly. We do not know your dietary preferences, restrictions, etc. So we'll let you provide the food, canned goods, non-perishables. Um, anything else? Anything else that would be good? 
medicine, exactly, definitely. Um, can even throw in, and for food, you can even throw in some comfort foods, some chocolate, some sugar to keep you, give you energy. Um, and, and Gail will have a few more items that she can throw in the bag. Um, we talked a little bit about this page, about coping with the disaster. Don't be too hard on yourself. If you're having a hard time, there is a national disaster distress hotline. The folks who answer that um, number are trained to provide you know, mental health services to folks who are going through a disaster situation. Um, and then just a few state resources I'll make you aware of. We've got Mass Options. Um, it is a free resource linking elders, individuals with disabilities, caregivers, and family members to services that help you continue living independently. Um, so give them a call um, or go to their website if any of these support services would be helpful for you or your family. We've got Requipment. This is a durable medical equipment uh, reuse program. So if you have you know, durable equipment like shower chairs or wheelchairs, you can donate to them um, and they'll you know, reuse it. You can also check out their inventory on their website and see if there's anything that you would like to pick up for free. So it's a, a reuse exchange program. Finally, um, We've got the Massachusetts Equipment Distribution Program, Mass EDP. Uh, we talked a little bit before about adaptive telephone equipment. So if that sounds like something that would be helpful for you, um, get in touch. They have um, technologies for all different types of disabilities and they'll provide the technology uh, at free or reduced cost. They even have iPhones right now that are equipped with accessibility features. Um, I can't promise you'll get an iPhone, and they will not play for, they will not pay for the phone plan, but they will pay for the equipment, or at least most of it. Um, and then the last thing I'll end with is um, the COVID-19 emergency protections are ending, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep yourself safe, you and your community members. So please stay up to date on your vaccinations. Get your flu shot when you need it. Um, there are treatments for COVID, so don't feel like you have to tough it out. Talk to your doctor if you do get sick. Um, wear a mask if you feel comfortable. I'll put mine on in a second. Um, and then this last page is just kind of a little summary of some takeaways from here. Um, before you go, please do fill out an evaluation for me so that I um, can prove to my boss that I was here. <laughs> um, and also it helps us make sure that we're, we're doing a good job. I think there might have been a attendance sheet that was rolling around okay over there i'll go and grab it for you yeah 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 i'll, I'll come and grab it or thank you um and i'm going to switch this over to gail hey everybody i'm gail from district attorney morris's office first can we give her a round of applause because she is always so informative and it's so interesting and she's so sweet when she delivers all this information <laughs> Uh, but before I talk about what I brought, which is just some supplemental things that we thought would be helpful, um, I just want to talk real quick about um, a few things that are important. Um, some current scams. Um, and I made some copies of um, some of the text messages that I've been receiving does everybody receive phone calls and text messages? Mm -hmm. You have to be very, very careful. More scams are coming through now by text message because they know that you'll respond uh, a little quicker. More people are more um, inclined to just hit, uh, it's just a natural reaction. You hit the link or you, you, you call the number. Um, and so this is something that I received and I, I was here, um, I think it was last fall maybe, uh, and I talked about scams and I had said a common scam that I received and I received this probably you know once every few months I would get a text message that said it was Bank of America and that my account was compromised or something similar to that um, or, or that um, they wanted to um, confirm a, a, a withdrawal or um, that there was a deposit that they thought was fraudulent whatever it, it was they they it was different every time their pitch was different every time and I used to always say 
I would know it was a scam because I don't bank at Bank of America. Well, now, uh, about two or three times a week, I receive one that says, um, citizen alert, your one-time passcode to log in. If other ones say that my account had a withdrawal, I bank at Citi Citizens Bank. So I was, whenever I saw it, I said, oh no. When it said pa my one-time passcode login. So I thought maybe my husband had tried to log in and could it and got a passcode. So instead of clicking the link or, or calling the number, I called my husband and he said no. So I looked at it again and I looked, it said citizen dash alert. And I thought, that's not how Citizens Bank would notify me. If you did not initiate, kindly tap um, with no comma, tap is, is um, uh, capitalized to validate your info instead of information. So you have to really kind of read it and see all the grammatical errors and ways that a, a, a business or a bank would never send a message. Doesn't necessarily mean that um, if it was all grammatically correct and uh, sounded professional that it's not a scam, which I recommend you do if you get this. This was on the news um, that bank, this is coming for Eastern Bank and Citizens Bank and basically every bank. And they're sending them out to millions of cell phone numbers hoping that they get just one person that will, that will respond to it. Um, always call your local branch. Don't react to this, never click a link, never, make the, never call the number. Call your local branch. They can look up the information. You probably have, you probably know uh, the, your teller there um, or the manager or, you know, it's a good way to actually <laughs> talk to them and say, I'm your customer and, um, and they want to help you. So that's why they're there and uh, I highly uh, recommend you do that just because you don't want to fall for this. So many people fell for this that it ended up being on the news and uh, and once, once you give out any kind of personal information, which I should also state that if you did click this link, it would actually bring you to a page that looked like the authentic Citizens Bank page that asked for your login, your username, and your account number, your password, everything. So then once you give that out, they now have access to uh, all your, your, your banking and you a lot of people use the same passwords for all of their accounts. They'll try that password for other accounts. So you just have to be very, very careful. And I put together um, a list, and many of you may have got it the last time I was here. Um, here it is right here. And this is just to have these numbers at your fingertips. Um, important numbers. If you get a phone call that says it's the IRS or um, the Internal Revenue, well I said Internal Revenue Service, Social Security, Medicare, whatever it may be. These are verified numbers. These are trusted numbers. You can call back and never call back the number that is on your caller ID or in a message or that they leave on a, on a voicemail. You want to make sure you call a trusted number and these are trusted numbers and you can add numbers to this, your, your utility customer service, your local bank branch, um, whatever you need, your credit card customer service numbers and you'll have it all at your fingertips if you were to get a phone call and you are wondering if it's uh, legitimate or not, you'll have the number to call. Um, you can always look on the back of your credit card or your debit card. So this is something good to have. Uh, another thing that it was just on the news, and I've been hearing a lot about it, are, does anybody use QR codes? You've got to be very, very careful because now they're covering, and you could, it could be a sign, scan this QR code for, for you know, the menu or whatever it may be, to make a payment, to get to a website, and they're co the scammers are covering them with their own QR codes um, to trick people. So you have to be very, very careful and make sure that you're you're um, scanning what you intend to scan. Um, let's see. So the post office put out a an alert that 
people are receiving text messages that they have uh, a package that cannot be delivered because the street, uh, the, the, your house number is not on it. People are responding to that. They're asking people not to respond to that. If you have any questions, you can call your, your, your post office. Don't respond. Don't click a link. Don't respond to the text message um, or an email. Um, and that they're also, they're, they've also said um, people are, some people have reported change of address um, for themselves that they did not, um, that they did not register with the post office. So someone else did it on their behalf to get their mail to, to be able to steal their identity. And then, so it's frightening, but you just have to take the steps to protect your identity like you do your health. So just take, when, I don't know if anybody used the shredding event last yeah. week. Good, oh good. Um, you are welcome to come to any of the shredding events that we host. Um, we, tr we hit basically every town in Norfolk County throughout the year. Um, we do really half in the spring and half in the fall. So you're welcome to come to any of the ones that we sponsor. But you also want to maybe pay attention to uh, free events that are in your town, maybe by the DPW or your bank or... Um, How do we get the list of where the shredding events are going to be? So it should be uploaded by the end of this week on our website. If not, you can give me a call and I can... Um, our web website is... Oh. It's our website. Uh, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office. It's actually... The website is listed on, on this sheet with all the phone numbers that I put together that everyone's going to get a copy of. So you can go on to that website. They won't be uh, uploaded on to the website until the end of the week because there are a few dates that we were confirming. So we kind of put it as a, almost like a poster on the, on the website. So, and again, you are, we encourage you to use the service. Um, so... In the bags, I'm just going to go through a couple things. And if anybody has any questions about scams, identity theft, never hesitate to call me at the office or when I'm here. Um, you know, just grab me and, and ask whatever you you need. And if I can answer it, I will, or, or I can point you in the direction for some some guidance. And so we put together supplemental bags, uh, and. I kind of made it so that it, you can just grab whatever you want. Not everybody is going to want um, the cups or, or whatever. So I, I did it kind of assembly line. But these are document bags. These are waterproof document bags. It actually says on the front, uh, there's some suggestions on what kind of documents to put in. Copies, I should say, of documents. Um, whatever you think you need, you can put them in, even for your, your you know, pet uh, information that you, you might need. Uh, so these bags will be, uh, yeah, I might actually just kind of put them over here so you can, just, if you want one, um, I really can only take one, unfortunately, because we are very limited to how many we have. Uh, does everybody have a file of life at home? Yeah. On your refrigerator? So uh, if you just need the insert, I kept them separate. You can just take the insert. Uh, and then just leave the, the magnet. But we also have wallet size, files of life, um, and y yeah, these are great. You can keep these in your in your wallet, in your <coughs> glove compartment. Um, put them in the red bag because this would be on your refrigerator. You can put this in the red bag. It's all the same info. The new cards actually have COVID information, vaccine information, so they're a little different than you might have had. So we now give out, we just got these, um, and if you were at uh, the talk on scams and identity theft uh, a few months ago, you probably got an RFID <laughs> protector from me, which was the hard case that has a, a barrier that uh, blocks skimmers from being able to take information from your credit, credit card and debit card. Um, a lot of people may see RFID protection on their wallets. That means you have a, a wallet that um, has protected your, your personal information on your, uh, and financial information on your um, credit cards and debit cards in the wallet. They have luggage now that has RFID protection. Well, these are just, unfortunately, these only really hold one uh, card. 
debit card or credit card. Uh, but these provide that protection. And really, the, somebody could walk by you with a skimmer, which is, you know, could be about this big, in their pocket, walk by you and take all of your information from your debit card and credit card, clone the card, sell the numbers, sell, you know, there's a lot that they can do with it. So you just want to make sure that you always, really, you only want to take out the cards that you plan to use. Um, but you want to protect the ones that you have with you. You know, you know what might be a good idea? What? If they could have like a sensor that would pick up that there's an RFID reader there. I know. Well, they're one step ahead of us all the time, so they <laughs> they would be able to fix that real quick. So, but the, for the in the meantime, this is a, a a good way. And they do have they have fancy wallets you can buy, um, but they also have. Uh, and I actually saw them at the, the dollar store recently. Yeah. Um, they hold about, I don't know, a dozen cards and then they're hard cases and those are RFID. You just want to look for RFID protection. Um, and you can get it for uh, carry-on luggage and, and big luggage because they can also do this with your passport. So you want to make sure that when you bring your passport, you're, bring, you're in the airport. Um, of course, that's the only time you want to bring your passport out is when you're, you're using it to fly. Um, it's not something you want to carry around with you uh, because if you lose it, um, you, know, it's, you just want to minimize any kind of uh, risk of identity theft. So um, this, again, holds one card. They're tight, but they go onto the back of your cell phone. You pull off the adhesive and attach it to your cell phone. Uh, my sister-in-law actually took one. She has a case on her phone that opens up. She put one on the back, one on the front, and not for her cards. She had pulled up the adhesive and attached to both sides to protect both sides because inside she keeps her credit card in almost like in a little wallet. So she actually made an RFID uh, phone case, basically. So um, you're welcome to, I think I, I brought about 100 or more of these. So if you want to take uh, a few each, that is uh, fine. We are limited on things, I'm sorry. Um, and we have a lot of cups. Um, so these would be perfect to throw into the um, backpack because you get that five gallon collapsible jug uh, that Abigail, I'm sure, demonstrated. You fill it up before any, uh, at the beginning of any kind of an emergency and you'll have the cups and we have plenty, and I actually have more underneath, so if you want to take like three or four each, feel free. I don't want to take them back with me. So we have flashlight keychains as well. So um, these, I know you get the great uh, hand crank. This is just a little added uh, keychain that we have here. And then a lanyard. So this is something that we actually had for a different um, um, program at our office, and we had some left over. So I, I give these out because I thought this would be great just to be able to throw your keys on, keep it around your neck if you have to evacuate for whatever reason. You kind of make it a little easier for you. And nail files and I have again I have about <laughs> 500 of these but these are great because if you're bored you can do your nails <laughs> or if you can manage to you know MacGyver this into some kind of tool you can use it to <laughs> so and there's I put in I mean I put there's not that many but I'm sure well, you know everyone has a pencil at home but what we had that weren't sharpened in my office, I grabbed. And they're all different because um, I, I get them at like, town days and stuff, and I grab them and I give them out for events like this. But I thought um, you can maybe use the tool to sharpen the pencil. <laughs> but um, I put in a 911 uh, word search. If you're bored, this might you know, be something that's fun. But on the back, is a lot of information about um, 911, and I, I, you probably went over everything, but um, the information to give um, about texting, I know that Abigail goes through this, 
But um, there's some more uh, important information that I encourage you to read too about why you know it might not have gone through, um, any kind of limitations to texting, um, and when to use it, and the information again the information to give what's important to give and how to give it. So that I just added the word search for something fun to do, um, and then. And this is something else. So don't have a lot of. I don't have enough copies of this, but I think that we might be able to make some copies, I right? I can make lots of white copies of it. Great. So this is uh, a first aid uh, manual, and it's just really kind of the common things. But it's good to have. It's really good to have just even at your house. Um, but if you were to um, encounter some kind of, if somebody needs any kind of help, you'll be able to provide, you know, the simple stuff. The um, um, you know, how to respond to if, if someone needed, um, a, you know, if they had a simple fracture or something like that, uh, or a, a, a minor burn. And, uh, so this is just good to have. Like I said, it's good to have at your house anyways. Um, but I put this together and uh, I couldn't make it like a booklet. So <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think I have about 25 copies. So anybody, some people might, you might be a nurse and you don't need this, but um, Something else that's good to have. And let's see. I think that it, oh, um, that green <coughs> paper right there. Sorry, I can't go too far. So a program, this is unrelated to this, um, but this is something I just wanted to um, let you know about. We're doing a program. It's a house number program. It is the law that you have your house number clearly displayed on your house. And actually, it's supposed to be, the numbers are supposed to be four inches uh, in size. So we are providing house numbers um, for people. And it's, it's, not only is it helpful for Meals on Wheels, it's, it's really for uh, emergency first responders to be able to get to your house um, and find it easily. Um, so they're supposed to be clearly displayed on your house, on your door, your mailbox. Um, if you want to let the Council on Aging know if you need numbers, um, it's funny because when I first started talking about this last year, we had actually just replaced our front stoop. And our front stoop is where it was kind of like on the side. It was very, it was perfect. We had a light going up to it and um, we replaced the front stoop. I was talking about this and I was actually talking about it uh, alongside a fire chief and he was explaining the reasons why you have to have these, which is pretty obvious. Um, and as I was, <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, it had been like three months since we had replaced our front stoop and I had yet to replace my own house numbers. So I, on the way home, I went and grabbed some, but we are doing this. We have the adhesive ones that you can put on your door. Uh, we have several different styles. I wish I brought some just to show you, but um, we have silver, we have brass, so um, we, they were actually donated to us by Curry Hardware and Quincy. Uh, and then we also have, again, the adhesive ones that you can attach to your mailbox or your, or your uh, front door. So if you need one, you can give your numbers to the Council on Aging and then they can let me know and I can get them all here. Just let them know what, if, they, if you want it to be the screw-on kind or the, the adhesive. Um, and the adhesive ones are, are, they're not plastic. They're like the kind of, um, vinyl. yeah, vinyl. Um, so, and there's, I think they're basically all the same, but they might be gold or, or silver. So, um, so yeah, that would be, that would be helpful if you just let her know. And I can throw some extras in too if you have other people that, or maybe you can even put it in the newsletter. But I just wanted to let you know this is a program that we are um, currently doing. So what I'll do is I'll put my stuff over here. So when you go through, you can take what you, what you want or what you think you um, want to add to your bag. Or, uh, and if we run out of anything, I can always get more. It's, I can get it here at some point. So you can just let me know that too. So thank you. And can we give another round of applause for Abigail?